Hi Chess.com, my name is Tatev Abrahamian and welcome back to my video series on imbalances. If you checked out my first video, we talked about queen versus three minor pieces and we saw how the queen dominated the three minor pieces. And we talked about what is it about a position that makes the queen so much more powerful than three pieces combined. In this video, we're still going to talk about uh, imbalance that involves a queen, but we're going to be looking at it from the other perspective and we're going to see how pieces can completely a dominated queen in a different kind of position. And as I mentioned in my first video, we're going to be focusing on how the dynamics of the position and the piece quality really uh, makes a difference and I, that is what determines the true value of the pieces. So this is one of my favorite games between Anish Giri and Levon Aronian from the 2018 Leuven GCT. So in this position, Levon played h6 and Anish responded with rook d1, which looks like a very logical move, an intermediate move that attacks the queen brings the rook to the open file because the rook was not really doing anything on e1 and also makes it so the knight can develop. So uh, you can pause in this position and think about what you would do. So maybe the title of the video, the video series, maybe will give you some kind of a hint, but do try to be objective and really think about what you would, you would play in this position with black. So here Lemon decides to take on g5 and sacrifice his queen. Uh, so let's pause and uh, really evaluate this position and see what is going on. So here, uh, black actually has a, a rook and a bishop for a queen, which is, uh, if we just look at it from point perf perspective, is just 8 versus 9, and the queen usually is better than a rook and a bishop. Uh, so when I look at the position, several things stand out to me. One of them is, so far, this back rank issue, uh, because there's uh, some kind of uh, mate threats on d1, so obviously I'm not going to checkmate you, but... If it was Black's position, you know, I am threatening to play g4 and checkmate you. But the main thing that I see that is wrong with White's position is this knight on b1. And as in my first video, when there was a bad minor piece on the board, the problem wasn't that the piece was bad in that current position, it's the long-term potential of the piece. So the problem with this knight is the knight cannot get out. So if White could play knight d2 in this position and... Uh, this knight wasn't hanging somehow, this position would be quite good for white, because then the pieces get out, the rook comes to the game, but like this is just way too many pieces, and black just has no problems with his position. So in the first video we talked about whenever there's a queen on the board, we want to talk about king safety, but this king is extremely safe, there's only one piece aiming at it, but one piece alone is not going to check me the king, because the king uh, has all the pawns in front of it, and a lot of pieces, so there's no way for white to get it. So white played h3, which is a very logical move, because uh, you're creating room for your king, there is no more back rank issues and no more g4. And now white actually wants to play queen e3 and develop. And if white manages to do that, again, long term white does have material advantage, so black does have to play with energy and make sure that uh, the pieces don't just um, safely get out. So bishop c5, which stops both this queen e3 move and also eyes this pawn. And uh, here Anish decides to play bishop d5, kind of closing this file and trying to develop his knight. So Levon takes and takes. So there's been a major change in the position, so this d file went from an open file to a semi-open file. And uh, if we pass the move, if we play something like, I don't know, rook e8, rook d6, try to double, then white's knight is going to get out. So again, it's a good time to take a pause in the position and think about how to continue with black. So here Levon played e4, which is an extremely strong move. So what is the idea behind this move? Is to, um, it's a tempo move, first of all. It asks the queen where it is going, uh, where the queen is going. And if you take the pawn, then I will si simply attack the queen. The queen doesn't have too many uh, squares to go to, so let's make a move. And rook e1. And now there's a lot of problems with white's position. And the main problem is the spin. And again, we're going back to the initial issue. This knight cannot get out, which means the rook cannot get out. So white is just playing with one queen and black is just playing with all their pieces. And of course, we also have the two bishops. And we know the two bishops are very, very strong in an open position. So I have so many options here. I can bring my rooks. Uh, I can check. Like, for example, I can check and force a weakness and then try to come after it. Uh, I can simply play bishop b7 and just take another pawn, and the two bishops are just going to be deadly in this position. So, of course, 
white cannot allow that. So he went back to d1, defending the d5 pawn. Because again, if the queen goes somewhere else, like g2 or g4, then again we take, the knight cannot get out. And the king is, again, we're going to see how weak this king is going to be, because we have, as black, a lot of pieces that are going to be um, attacking this king, and the king only has one queen defending him. So instead he went queen d1, and now e3. Again, you cannot develop your knight. The rook comes here. Uh, he decides not to take with the bishop, so he's bringing his rook into the game with tempo. So king h1 was played. It's also possible to play knight d2, but that would also allow rook d5. I mean, it would be more or less a transposition, so we'd still get to this position. And now we see that all these pieces have joined the game, so now both of these rooks are playing. So white did finally manage to develop the knight, but it came at the cost of both of black rooks joining the game, as well as the position opening up, the pawns from the center disappearing, which means these bishops are just going to become monstrous, and uh, white did come under very strong attack very quickly. So queen went to c1, getting out of the pin, so now the knight can finally get out. Uh, Levon went rook f5, probably trying to put his rook on f2. Uh, so this would be a very strong move, of course, putting the bishop on this diagonal, because the bishop on a6 is not doing anything, really. And now that the king is on h1, this is where the bishop wants to be. And if um, if the knight moves somewhere, for example, if knight b3, uh, there is a very pretty checkmate by black. And just rook d2. And we kind of see how lonely this king is here, and how these pieces are just on the other side of the board, and the rook has not even moved yet. So again, white is not using all of his pieces. So instead, rook f5 was played, so the knight went to b3. The bishop slides back. So now bishop b7, and now we see that this pawn is under attack, and there's um, king g1 is not possible because of this bishop. So we see just way too many pieces aiming at the king, and the king is just not going to find any kind of safety. So rook d5, the queen is getting harassed, and the queen is kind of out of squares. The queen would love to go to f2, but unfortunately there's a discovery attack, and um, black will just end up up a piece. So that's a um, very easy win. So instead, uh, the queen went to c1, and... Um, this is hardly any kind of progress for white, because the knight went from b1 to b3. But the knight on b3 is not really part of the game, because the game is happening on the king's side. And the knight on b3, while it's better than the knight on b1 was, it's still not going to be defending the, the white king. So the rook went to e2. So the rook did manage to join the game, but unfortunately uh, it's too late. So of course it's possible to just take on g2 and go up many pawns, taking the entire second rank. And white does have to give up the queen, because otherwise... Um, probably also have mate, but at the very least I can just win the queen. Or probably can just... Uh, should be mate. Instead, Levon plays rook f2, asking the queen where she's going. So the rook finally joins the game. But as the pieces join the game, uh, white actually resigns here, because there's just no way to defend g2. And uh, once I take on g2, you will get mated either on the first rank or with the discovery check. And something like queen g3 doesn't really help, because I simply go to e2 and um, I will take on g2. And once this pawn falls, it's just the end of the game. So unfortunately, the... Development, uh, I mean, it did happen in the game, but it did not lead to anything good for white. So if we compare our first uh, example to this one, we will see we we'll see how um, we see different dynamics with the queen. So in this position, again, point wise, black was actually not doing as well because black only had a rook and a bishop versus a queen. But because of the dynamics of the position, because of better development, and this long term problem of the knight on b one that we saw in the beginning. Black just completely dominated the game and won quite smoothly, as White was just not able to create any kind of counterattack and even um, any kind of defense against all these pieces that were aiming at the king. 
So hopefully these videos will help you make better decisions when it comes to this kind of imbalances and giving up your queen against a two rooks or rook and a bishop and hopefully you are understanding this kind of dynamics a little better by now. Thanks everyone for checking out this video and make sure you're checking out the rest.